Coming up on this episode of the IoT Inc. Business Show. So a smart city to us is really about a, a, a networking platform uh, based on IPv6 to connect all of the infrastructure assets of a city and help them more efficiently manage those assets by em- employing networking smarts. Wondering how IoT is being rolled out in cities? Look up, into the light. Street lights are the perfect stepping stone to producing smart cities. Changing their bulbs to LEDs pay for themselves in three to five years, but also present the opportunity to build out wireless mesh networks. These elevated networks allow more lighting control slash efficiency and provide the foundation for other smart city services such as power and parking. In this episode of the IoT Business Show, I speak with Sterling Hughes about lessons learned in deploying Silver Springs networks in cities around the world. This is Encore Episode 4 of 4, which originally played in the IPv6 Show podcast. Keep listening for a great case study in infrastructure IoT. All this and more on this episode of the IoT Inc. Business Show. The people, the business, and the technology of the next generation internet. This is the IoT Inc. Business Show. And now, here's your host, Bruce Sinclair. Hello and welcome to the IoT Inc. Business Show. This show is made possible by sales of my book, IoT Inc., published by McGraw-Hill, and the IoT Inc. Certified IoT Professional, or ICIP, online training and certification program. Become a certified IoT professional by completing the program's three courses, ICIP Technology, ICIP Business, and ICIP Strategy and Digital Transformation. Details of which can be found at www.iot-inc.com. That's www.iot-inc.com. With me today on episode 15 is Sterling Hughes. Sterling is GM for Silver Springs Global Smart City Business. He led the design and development of Silver Springs IPv6 networking fabric, and in the process, he authored more than 10 networking patents. So today's going to be good. We're going to get to go both deep dive down into technology, and we're going to get to talk business too. Sterling, welcome. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Bruce. Uh, so, so what have you been spending your time on in the last week or so? Any any fires you've been putting out? Well, uh, this week we're actually implementing um, one of our smart city projects in Copenhagen. Uh, so we ah. have we have a contract with the city of Copenhagen to network twenty thousand LED lights, every one of which has an IPv6 address on it. Uh, and this week we're actually implementing a project where we're talking to the traffic lights, and based upon the uh, signal of the traffic light, if it's green. We turn the lights mm-hmm. up to 100 percent. If it's red, we turn the lights down to 40 percent. So we're actually in the process of implementing uh, a dynamic lighting project this week. Really interesting. So you, are you saying the street lights are being controlled by this, or you're saying the intensity of the actual traffic lights? The intensity of the street lights are being controlled by the traffic lights. So the idea being, if the traffic light is red, you don't need to mm-hmm. overlight the road. Uh, but when it's green and cars are going by. Uh, you do care about bike and pedestrian safety uh, because you actually have traffic flow. And so you move the lights up to 100% right. when traffic is flowing, and you dim them down to 40% when there's no traffic flowing. This gives you additional energy savings and improved safety over the traditional method, which would be some a fixed dimming scheme where you would only hmm. dim them down to 50% ever, and you wouldn't raise the light level when the traffic was flowing. <laughs> so w- what about LA and, and carjacking? I would think mm-hmm. it would maybe be the opposite. When, <laughs> exactly. You'd want it to be really bright when you're stopped. and when it, well, when There are really definitely dark, articles so you... <laughs> out there about having the police use uh, network streetlights to blink them and turn up the light level uh, during high crime areas. So it's not so far-fetched. No kidding. No kidding. Oh, that's, that's funny. Well, okay. Well, listen, why don't we start by you giving me... Uh, just a brief overview of yourself and uh, tell me a little bit about your history in IPv6 and the Internet of Things. Sure. So I joined Silver Spring about 10 years ago now in 2004. And my background was actually not in the networking space prior to joining. So learning IPv6 was kind of new for me when I joined Silver Spring. Mm. Uh, my background was more in compilers 
and uh, lower level stuff, having worked on the PHP programming language. But I joined uh-huh. SilverSpring because it was a really interesting challenge. So, uh, you know, fast forward 10 years later, we've networked about 18 million uh, homes and businesses. Uh, they're mostly power meters and streetlights. Mm-hmm. That's the majority mm-hmm. of the volume. And every single one of those has an IPv6 address in them. So I joined Silver Spring about 10 years ago with the, the, the company's pitch, the founder's pitch to me was, you know, join Silver Spring and really learn about networking and build one of these right. networks because there weren't that many IPv6 networks out there 10 years ago. Uh, so we built an IPv6 networking stack from the ground up, uh, actually on a, uh, at the time, custom physical layer, which has since been standardized to IEEE 802.15.4G. Uh, and so okay. we built an entire radio stack using IPv6 to connect smart meters, to connect street lights, to connect all of these dip- parking meters, all of these different devices that are now being connected today. Uh, and so my background is in building that networking stack specifically at the routing and the, the Mac layers, and then over time uh, kind of growing as Silver Spring Road uh, into a business role working on our smart cities and uh, distribution automation businesses. Nice, nice. Now, so what what is the definition of a smart – how smart are cities today, I guess, <laughs> I, I guess would be my question. Well, yeah, that's always uh, – it depends who you talk to. When you talk to Silver Spring, uh, the definition mm. of a smart city is networking all of the infrastructure in a city. So, yep. to, you know, what you saw in smart grids 10 years ago was that yep. utilities had a lot of assets throughout the distribution grid and none of them had any networking smarts in them. So your power meter – was read once a month by a meter reader. What made it smart grid was when you network that power meter and instead of being having it read manually once a month, it had an IP address, you could interrogate the meter and you could see what somebody's energy usage was in real time. And not only that, you could communicate to the meter so you could ask them to shift their load in a peak, uh, a peak demand period as an example. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and it was really smart grid was about connecting utilities to the infrastructure they were managing and they were managing large scale infrastructure Cities, uh, on actually a smaller scale than, than some of the big IOUs, have similar problems with managing a lot of infrastructure, whether it be water meters or their electrical mm-hmm. infrastructure for street lighting or other elements like parking. So a smart city to us is really about a, a, a networking platform uh, based on IPv6 to connect all of the infrastructure assets of a city and help them more efficiently manage those assets by em- employing networking smarts. Interesting. So, and right now it sounds like what you're connecting would be uh, water utility, electricity, and parking. That's that's the that's kind of the the trio right now. Yeah, for us in the city space, actually, our, we 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 do connect all of those applications. But the first mm-hmm. application we find is often streetlights, and that's because yeah. we're very much a radio company as well as an IPv6 company, and the streetlights okay. just happen to be really high up. So they make a great. So our product is an, is a mesh networking system. So every device routes for other devices in the network. And so the the, the challenge or the the goal, if you want to sell products into a new territory, is to get the infrastructure Mm -hmm. in place. Because once you have the infrastructure in place, then connecting devices to it is very cost effective, right? You don't have to pay for uh, putting in the cellular connection. You don't have to pay for a bunch of relays, which can act as repeaters through the network. Uh, And Mm -hmm. so streetlights are an ideal first application. Because they're so high up, because they can repeat for other devices, uh, you can go and implement a streetlight project, which has a pretty good payback. Uh, Mm -hmm. You save energy and you uh, reduce operations cost. But then it also rolls out the network for additional applications on it. Nice, nice. Okay, I, I didn't think about that. So, so the streetlight and and I would imagine you know you could wire those too if you wanted. But then you have a wire, then you have a, a radio network they could use for. For other applications, is am I understanding it exactly? Correctly? Because when you look at radio communication, and, and you have to remember, the challenges we solve are actually from a radio communication problem perspective pretty hard. If you look mm. at covering, for example, meet electric meters, everybody probably mm-hmm. would say, "Yeah, I have decent cell connection outside of my house." Often, meters are underground in basements, and I don't know right. about you, but in my basement, there's no cell cellular connection. <laughs> So really the game, when it comes to networking these infrastructure assets, they're off, you can't really decide where the street light is or decide where the meter is or move it uh, when you want to network it. So the best way to get connectivity to these assets is to have another radio close by. Right? 
Uh-huh. You can either increase your power, but at some point you're increasing your power exponentially to the point where if you're 10 miles away, you have to go at such a high output power that it's infeasible, or you mm-hmm. can be closer to the device. And so laying out street lights and, and, and deploying other infrastructure allows you to be close to the devices that are hard to reach and therefore network more applications. Yeah, yeah, and street lights being, well, close to parking spaces, generally speaking, other than the ones that are buried and and how and homes and, and so forth. That makes a... Uh, it makes a lot of sense. And also, you know, just in my neighborhood, they recently replaced all the streetlights with LED. And so that would be, an, I would imagine that would be a good business opportunity to say, well, since you're doing that or or at the same time, maybe you should uh, network them. As well, well, and the LED is a, a digital light, right? So it, it, it's hard to dim an existing uh, streetlight to save yes, energy. right. Because you have a typically a ferromagnetic ballast, uh, the power factor, the, the energy uh, elements that are required to look basically to dim an existing light, you have to dim it based on voltage and mm-hmm. voltage based dimming gives you a, a pretty bad effect, uh, in terms of power factor and other things. When you mm-hmm. switch to LEDs, if the LED is implemented correctly, you don't actually, you, you have a unity power factor and you can dim to a much lower level. So you can save energy without affecting the grid. And so LEDs, nice. not only do you have, you know, a three, uh, uh, you know, a three to five year payback. Uh, from implementing LEDs, but yeah. once you put communications in, you can dim it about 50% down. And so you also get a great, you get an additional payback till it's about one to two and a half years with networking and homes. Jeez. Nice. Nice. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's, let's deep dive a little bit into the IPv6 yep. of, of things as well. So what's the use case then here? Well, so uh, when we started, you know, I think as, as we mentioned, we have about 18 million, uh, homes and businesses connected, which means Jeez. smart meters. Uh, yeah. When we looked at networking that, a, a typical utility like, say, PG&E has about 5 million uh, smart meters deployed. And if you were looking at, at networking those with IPv4 addresses and managing that many IPv4 addresses, it'd be a real challenge. Uh, they're mm-hmm. Just address allocation and address. You certainly have the address space to go do that with v4, but... Uh, provisioning those addresses, and then can you imagine if you had to reassign an address range across that network? Mm-hmm. It becomes a challenge to manage all of those ad- addresses. With the larger address space in V6, provisioning becomes much more simple. So the way we do our network provisioning is we have access points which bridge between a cellular connection and our mesh our mesh network. And the provisioning of an address onto the system is simply the network prefix of the access point, so we, we, we administratively assign that, combined with the MAC address of the device that's connecting to that address access. Mm. So the device is using uh, stateless address configuration, automatically provision their addresses, automatically gets routes from the access point without us having to manage onerous central infrastructure to go do that. Hmm. So so it's really a, a way of, of making the of just making it easy on yourself and, and it's, it's almost like an operational uh, thing as opposed to a connectivity thing. Cause it's funny because you know, when, when people, people basically ask me all the time, it's like, why bother? You know, why, why would I want to put my lights on IP? I don't want to act. Uh, they're going to be in a private network. I'm not going to provide access uh, to them. And, and then I kind of remind them, well, you never know. You can never say never. And, and, but then the other side of it is, well, it's also just the practical, the practical operations of uh, building the network out and when you're dealing with anything over well anything with seven you know digits it becomes it becomes really complicated unless you have a system so it's more of an operational almost uh use case in this ca- in this situa- situation yeah and, and the why there, there's kind of two debates right that one mm-hmm. is the why why do ip in the first place and that certainly yeah. was a prevalent question in the market in 2004 i think most providers mm-hmm. these days have been sold that ip is the right mm-hmm. answer uh, and, and the why do IP is actually pretty simple. It's, it's more about, uh, for example, on, if you look at security, right? If legacy systems have all implemented their own security protocols, none of which are, are peer reviewed. Not, you know, a lot of people talk about the Heartbleed bug, which is a terrible bug that has affected yeah. a lot of, uh, sites and infrastructure. But the point is somebody actually found that bug. Whereas if you have a lot of proprietary systems out there that haven't implemented IP, you have no idea what security vulnerabilities are in those systems. You don't have the same set of eyes on them. You don't have the same set of infrastructure behind them. And right. so it becomes a lot harder to uh, 
manage and deploy those networks, and, and there's a lot more risk in it, right? If you choose a proprietary system from a single vendor, you if that vendor goes away, who's going to support that system? What's the roadmap mm-hmm. going to be for a proprietary system that you know has one vendor supporting it versus IP, which has hundreds or thousands of vendors behind it? So that was kind of the first argument that we needed to get through. And then there was mm-hmm. the why IPv6 versus IPv4. And that, right. for us, frankly, was almost exclusively around provisioning. So that okay. was, it, was, it was about managing the address ranges, the number of devices that we actually had to manage, and having that much larger address space made address assignment much simpler. Now, on the other side, um, you know, Choosing choosing IP makes a lot of sense, and and you you know you're you're preaching to the converted <laughs> here, right? But however, um, there's just you know an open system is better than a closed system. I think we can you know all squint our eyes and agree and agree to that. But there's going to be right now. There's there's very few um, sensors. There's very few uh, end nodes, like end end things, I suppose, for the Internet of Things that are kind of IP based. So does that mean you guys have to construct? Uh, hardware as well. I mean, or were we able to actually shop for it off the shelf somewhere? Uh, we we actually had to construct the hardware ourselves. That was, I think, less due to IPv6. I mean, an IPv6 mm-hmm. implementation can be uh, pretty simple, right? I think our first IPv6 implementation fit in uh, 30kb of code, and that was with so compiled binary code. Uh, we implemented it on an at mega 128, which is a tiny little micro that's typically used for embedded sensors, uh, but not mm-hmm. real processors. So IP itself, the software challenge there wasn't too big. Uh, the reason we had to implement our own hardware and our own radios was for the kind of ge- geographic area that we needed to cover. There weren't very good mm-hmm. radio solutions out there. So uh, taking pg e as the example, again, it's about 70,000 square miles of service territory. And we had to cover both the dense urban areas like San Francisco, as well as the super rural areas uh, in the Central Valley, right? Hmm. So you you had this wide uh, geographic service area, area. And so what we needed to do was develop a radio that could talk those distances. So our our radios are based on 900 megahertz, and we use frequency hopping. Uh, This is, again, Mm -hmm. IEEE 802.15.4G, where where you get extremely large range uh, from these radios, and a fair amount of capacity in the network. So kind of some basic stats are uh, our maximum range. We have links measured up to about 30 miles. Oh, and so you have these very long range links. Uh, at the same time, the data requirements on a per device basis are not that high. So, you know, we're collecting meter read results, right? That's about max six kilobytes a day uh, mm-hmm. of data. But you have to connect, collect that from five million devices, right? So you need a lot of capacity within the network. So our, our challenges at the radio level were quite unique. And so that's why we developed our custom, a, a custom radio. At the IP layer, uh, you know, implementing IPv6, it's not actually that hard, right? There's a lot of stuff out mm-hmm. there, and it's, it's pretty easy to, to put, put a stack together. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, how far down does the IP reach? Uh, are we talking all the way down to a streetlight, or, is, or yep. do you have aggregators? I mean, gateways? How how, how far are you going down? So essentially, every light comes on the, a day in the life of a light or a meter is uh, mm-hmm. comes up and it discovers its neighbors. Uh, it discovers its mm-hmm. na- neighbors at layer one and layer two. So layer one is a frequency hopping network. Uh, layer two is a 802.15.4e uh, media access layer. And it, it comes out and discovers its neighbors. Those then go up to the IP layer. Uh, it then looks for routing advertisements from every one of its neighbors, and it joins an access point. When it joins an access point, it forms an IP address using the concatenation of its network prefix, which is a slash 64 network prefix, and it, and the device's MAC address. So every device has a unique uh, IPv6 address. In fact, uh, actually one of the, the cool things about our system is that every device joins multiple access points for redundancy. So mm-hmm. it will not only join uh, the first access point it sees or the best access point, it'll join the second best. So if its best access point goes down, it's simultaneously reachable on another access point. And so what happens is these devices become multi-homed. So they have a primary ad- address, which is the IPv6 address of the first access point it joins. And then it has a secondary IP address with the, with the second one. 
it then sends a dynamic DNS update to our central systems. So a, a standard kind of uh, 2136 DNS update, and it, it'll send an ordered list of its IP addresses to the head-end system. So the head-end system then knows which address to contact it on. Uh, kind of moving up the stack from there, uh, we run DTLS, which is U a UDP-based version of TLS. And then on top of that, we run, uh, typically, we support both TCP and UDP. But for the type of applications we run, UDP is a better fit. So we yeah. run UDP on top of, the, top of that. Uh, and then uh, CoAP, which is a constrained app application protocol. So you chose CoAP and, and XMPP. I mean, did you look at any of the other application, um, at the, any of the other application uh, communication? Uh, we did. Our, or mechanisms? Our, our needs were a bit more humble. Um, so, yeah. it, it, you know, originally our protocol was a proprietary protocol. It was very, very simple. Um, we, we've, we've since migrated to CoAP, which is actually still pretty simple. Um, but, you know, we're just reading objects from the devices. So I think, you know, lessons learned where we started with a proprietary protocol where everything was just binary encoded, which is, you know, you got to imagine when you're developing a system and you're looking down the barrel of 5 million meters to be deployed and you have no idea if it's going to work, but the sales guy sold it, right? So what are your thoughts on, on network standardization then? It seems like you guys have taken it seriously by implementing an end-to-end -end IP network, but gosh, I mean, uh, how many are actually, are we going to standardize? Because it seems like right now we're silos everywhere. A everywhere is its own silo, and we're not getting any of the real benefits of uh, standardization. So what are your thoughts or Silverstone's thoughts on that? Well, I think there's been a number of new technical challenges in, in standardization. And the, the, the first, the first, the way we approached the problem first was to actually fix the technical problems mm -hmm. and then to work in the standards committees to go uh, work with other vendors to standardize on the technical problems we've all solved. So, for example, if you look 10 years ago at the radio layer, everybody was proprietary. Um, and so our, in our, in our mind, the first step was to standardize the hardware. Okay because that's the thing you can't change in the field. And so uh, in 2007, we started the IEEE 802.15.4G effort to standardize on the physical layer. Uh, and since then, we, th there's been a number of standards that have kind of built up uh, beyond that. So IEEE 802.15.4E for the Mac, um, as well as uh, the, the role ripple standards in IETF for, for routing over lossy networks has been a great standard. Um, so you've, you've gotten a fair number of standards out there that all piece together on the hardware side, you're paint saying a complete picture. Mm -hmm. Um, so now what really the focus in the IOT community is, is on having interoperability frameworks for this. So 802.15.4G has enough options that you can specify any data rate, any frequency range, uh, and it, and everybody could implement it differently. So now what, what's happening is the vendors are getting together and coming in and having interoperability testing and interoperability profiles. One that I'd call out is, is the Wysun Alliance, where I, I think about a year ago we actually announced interoperability in an end-to-end -end ping with Cisco. <laughs> so there is, you know, the standards weren't there 10 years ago. I'd say about two years ago the standards really got to a point where you could implement interoperable systems. And now we're, we're getting very close to the point or we're at the point where multiple vendors can actually test interoperability amongst each other, have golden units, and then that's what's going to create the ecosystem uh, around these standards. Yeah, well, and I think if you know if we were if we were to switch back on on the uh, on the utility side of things, um, obviously Zigbee kind of had more or less a almost a monopoly you know at, at the lower levels speaking of the hardware and then maybe a couple layers up from there and, and it's my understanding that it was really from a business point of view that the the utilities or the end customers were saying listen we need to we need to open this up uh, I mean you've you've been talking up to this point you know for the hardware now what about expanding that a little bit a little bit further where's Zigbee today is it still like the standard or are we escaping beyond beyond uh, you know that proprietary system, although I know they sort of opened it up and so forth, but, but what, what's happening on that side? And they have, and you're seeing some momentum behind behind the, the new open standard. So Zigbee is, if you look at 1.3, mm -hmm. it's an entire 
uh, layer one through layer seven stack with interoperability and testing around that. That is not IP. Uh, so I think in 2008, uh, I may be wrong on my dates, but there, there was an effort to move it to Zigbee IP, yeah. and that's called Smart Energy Profile 2.0. Uh, and, and the reasoning behind that is, is certainly open standards and IP are, are a good part, but even think more practically, at some point you may want to talk to your meter with Wi-Fi and not with a uh, 2.4, 802.15.4 chip. Sure. And the Zigbee stack as constituted in 1.3 wouldn't allow you to do that because it wasn't multi-transport. It was a, a networking stack that was developed around a single transport. So it didn't support PLC. It didn't support Wi-Fi. It only supported 802.15.4. Right. Uh, Smart Energy 2, uh, Profile 2 took a while to be developed, but I think it's now the point where you have interoperability and you have stacks being developed around that. And so I'm actually pretty bullish on that getting implemented in the home and everybody seeing a few more transports besides just uh, 2.4 and 802.15.4 when it comes to going inside the home. Mm -hmm. What about Bluetooth? Is there is there a hope there? <laughs> well, you know, honestly, we don't do too much with Bluetooth. Mm. Uh, so we see it on the – we use it on some of our install tools uh, to basically mate the PC with our – uh, field service unit, but on the devices themselves, we don't see it much in the home because it just doesn't have the range of even a NATO 215.4 chip. Yeah, yeah. Um, going back to the standards, uh, so what are the challenges right now from a standardization point of view? I mean, I I like what you're saying. It's kind of industry is is leading the way to a certain extent and almost, I guess, building de facto standards first and then going to the standards bodies and and working with each other. Uh, as I understand, you're explaining it. And then, you know, we're kind of like reverse engineering the standards to a certain extent. Now, what about, what are the challenges moving forward? Because you've, you've been concentrating mostly on, on the radio and on the, on the, the link layer. Uh, but I'm, I'm looking at that, that wide expanse or abyss between, between there and the data. And, you know, if, what's happening, what's happening in between there? Well, I think that's right. The, the, I think the, you know, if you looked at it, the past couple of years have all, been about standardizing the physical layer through the networking layer. Mm. Uh, we're now getting to the point where it's really about coming up together with application layer interoperability profiles. Yeah. Today, uh, if you want standards at the application layer, you're really looking at a web services standards for exchanges. We think that those standards should extend all the way down to the device. So mm -hmm. on the network management side, as an example, you would use SNMP to go pull back network statistics from our devices. There's no equivalent device level standard for reading the meter. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, I think the next step is going to be that now, now that everybody's converged on IP, converged on uh, using 15.4G for these large scale networks, I think you're going to see uh, people start to define the application layer MIBs and the, the, the SNMP type format for data exchange at the application layer. And so you feel that, um, I guess, you know, through through the networking layer, it, it, the job is done? I mean, it, it's pretty much standardized, and what needs to be there is, is, is useful enough, or I guess, I mean, has enough utility to cover all the use cases? Well, the job's never done, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, I think we've gotten to the point where vendors are together. There are testing frameworks around this. Uh, there are interoperability profiles. So you're really, we're in a pretty good place there, mm -hmm. especially from where we've come from. Uh, so I think there's going to be constant refining of that. Uh, the Wysun Alliance is a very new alliance. The testing is very new. Mm -hmm. so there's a promotion effort around that that really needs to happen. But I think we're, we're at a place where vendors can develop interoperable products. Um, at the application layer, we have a bit further to go. But it only it only follows that that would come next. Yeah, it does because I mean, if yeah, I mean, you can have lots of great uh, applications or services, but you want to, at some point the value will be greater than the sum of the parts when you can actually connect uh, between them. Um, besides yeah. the Weissen Alliance, so what are some other Ipso? Doesn't it also do an interoperability? I mean, are there any others um, you know that that people should be aware of uh, for for vendors to come together and and um, do this interoperability testing? Well, so Ipso is definitely a good one. Uh, there's the Lyson Alliance. Uh, Zigbee, actually, for the home area network stuff is a big one. Okay. Uh, so those are some of the major ones we see. Okay. 
Um, so you've been in this for a while. Uh, looking back on on this, I guess in particular for the Silver Springs implementation, is there anything that you would do differently? I mean, uh, it seems like you had hindsight or foresight, I should say, to to approach this as a well as a as an IPv6 network. Um, what are some of the lessons learned? I mean, and, and would you have changed anything if if you were to do it differently, or if you had the chance to, to redo it, so to speak? Well, so we did. Um, okay. <laughs> our, this was actually the uh, second generation. So the product I've, I've been talking about when we implemented it uh, was the second generation we developed. I think the big things we learned in developing it were to go end-to-end yeah. on these networks mm-hmm. instead of built, implementing collector architectures. Right. So that was a big lesson learned. Um, the, you know, If you looked at our original system, it was IPv6, but the access points themselves were collectors. And you'd think that that's better because you were closer to the network so you can get feedback on congestion and un- have a better understanding of the local medium mm-hmm, conditions. Mm-hmm. But what we found is you should just basically have a better radio and going in t- and the, the improvement you got from network capacity by being close to the RF mesh was offset by the complexity you had to have by having a collector architecture. Right. So that was one big learning for us. Right. I think the other was, you know, our original security protocols were for the were proprietary, um, and we've since moved to standards-based uh, security protocols. Which makes total sense. And the, yeah. and the original thought behind it was, you know, well, DTLS or one of these things, they're, you know, they're really complicated, and I don't know. And you kind of looked at it, and they, they are, and um, we thought we could save bandwidth um, by going with a slightly more tuned protocol, mm-hmm. which we did. But as you go through that, you find all of the bugs you add and, and all of the, the kind of trade-offs you made actually come with an unintended consequence. Mm-hmm. And so even though we started by looking at DTLS, originally paring it down or looking at a co-op or looking at um, proto buffs and paring them down, what we eventually found was with just going with industry standards. Yeah you actually avoided, um, so you have to pick the right standards, but if you can go with industry standards, you avoid a lot of the pitfalls that other people have already found for you. Mm. So I think I would have been more aggressive uh, going to those and, you know, more aggressive. That was 2007 when we went to these, but those would be probably the two biggest learnings. And so these unintended uh, consequences, what would be an example? Oh, uh, you know, just for example, protobufs as as a good example of that. Okay. If you develop just a binary protocol, it's a lot more packet efficient mm. and you save a lot of bandwidth on the network. But when you change the data structures, maintaining compatibility between versions becomes really complicated, right? Because you have to look up what version is of, of the device you're running. And then based upon that, you have to reform a separate uh, struct. If you use a protobuf where you actually can process the packets and, and pull out individual fields, you can be a lot more flexible in how you process data coming back. It comes with a with an overhead. You're probably um, costing you know an extra two three bytes per per integer. All right. But that overhead is so convenient as you version your packets over time that it's really worth it. And in fact, you know, in our original version, we didn't implement comp- compression on our packets. Once we implemented compression, the difference was negligible. <laughs> nice, nice. All right, well, I want to end it more, let's go back business. And I want to end it um, just using my example in my hometown. And in fact, I guess I need to look into this, but I do not think they wired our, our new LED lights. I just noticed that they came What's up. What's your hometown? Uh, in Pleasanton, California. So oh, I don't think they did. I don't think they did. So... Um, you're talking to you're you're in a situation and you're talking to the business light. I mean the lighting business owner. I don't know who that would be <laughs> at PG and E for Pleasanton. What what's your what's your what is your pitch to them? I mean why why should they uh, go toward IOE um, as opposed to just you know just swapping those light bulbs with uh, with LEDs? Well, it's it's really simple. It comes down to two or three things. The first is if you're going to go out and you're going to replace every light with an LED, that's your opportunity to, to, to go out and install a network. Absolutely. If you install that network for all of the other applications you're going to run, you're going to save an additional 50% of your energy usage. 
and you're going to reduce your operations cost by an additional 70 to 80 percent because you're going to know when the light failed. You're going to be able to send a field crew there instead of having them drive around looking for added lights. And you're going to be able to dim the lights based on traffic conditions. So you're not spending too much. Uh, so you're not spending excess energy, right? Because today, lighting is provisioned for high traffic times, hmm. six to nine. I didn't know that. The rest hmm. of the time, you're just wasting energy by keeping these lights at full brightness. Hmm. Okay. So it's so you're basically saying it's an efficiency, it's an efficiency, um, basically business uh, yep. argument. It's energy efficiency and operational efficiency, and it provides you the ability to roll out a network for the other applications you want to implement. Nice, nice. All right, Sterling. Well, thank you. I think uh, I think that was uh, really good. I think you are a pioneer um, by uh, by moving uh, to IPv6 so early on, and I think a lot of our listeners will appreciate all the arrows that you received in your back uh, by being the first one in there. So, um, before we leave, where would you like to send our listeners? Is there um, what website for yourself or your company? Uh, where should people go to learn more about what you are? You know how you've actually put this into into business. Uh, go to www.silverspringnet.com slash smart cities. Okay. Uh, very much for the interview. It was great. Oh, thank you. And we'll, we'll get this information. We'll put it in the show notes, everybody. This will be, uh, gogo6.com slash one five. And, uh, thanks again, Sterling. We will uh, talk to you soon. Thank you. Okay. That was a detailed talk with Sterling Hughes of Silver Spring Networks. This podcast goes vertical, deep diving into different topics each week. If you prefer a more horizontal and structured approach to learning IoT business and its orbiting technologies, check out my book IoT Inc., published by McGraw-Hill, or become a certified IoT professional by completing the ICIP training and certification program. For details, just go to www.iot-inc.com. Also go to www.iot-inc.com for an analysis of this episode, links to things that were mentioned during the episode, and very importantly, the episode's PDF transcript. Just search for the name of the episode or the guest. If you're new to this podcast, subscribe. That way you'll get every week's episode delivered straight to your device. Or, if you've been listening for a while, there are three ways you can support the show. You can leave a rating or a review on iTunes. Just go to iot-inc.com slash iTunes. It only takes one click to leave a rating, a little bit longer to leave a review. You can share it on social. I'm on LinkedIn, to a lesser extent, on Twitter. And, of course, you can support the show by buying my book, IoT Inc., or the ICIP Training and Certification Program. That's how I pay the bills. Next week's episode is Networking Protocols Like Lego with Michael Richardson of Saddleman Software Works. I hope you can join me then. I'm your host, Bruce Sinclair. Thank you for listening. Until next week, may your path to IoT business be a bright one. You have been listening to the IoT Inc. Business Show. 